Um, so yeah, I've, I've been working at the jails for about three and a half years now. Uh, it's been a really, really enlightening experience. I have learned a lot, not just about humanity, but about myself. Um, yesterday, even yesterday, we had some rock and worship services. Uh, God is really moving there. I'm kind of going to mix some of those stories in today about uh, what God is doing for uh, the, the inmate population. Uh, we, we read Matthew 25. He has a heart for those who are incarcerated. And often, they kind of get the, the last bits of, of what's left over from governmental decisions, societal decisions, relational decisions. So as you think about uh, the incarceration system this week, if you think about it, that's everyone's assignment, think about it. <laughs> as you think, just please be praying. Um, but like I said, it's been so enlightening. Uh, I, I get to share, but I've had so much shared with me. Uh, so just to share a little bit of that this morning, I compiled a list of 10 of the top things that I've enjoyed learning. I promise you all of these things have some kind of story attached behind them. But being jail side, I have opportunity for inmates to kind of tell me how they do things. Um, life hacks, if you will. Uh, so 10 top things that I've learned in my three and a half years. Number one, you can use toothpaste to hang pictures on walls if you don't have thumbtacks. <laughs> you can do that at home too if you run out of thumbtacks. Number two, you can make uh, tattoo ink with a pen a brown paper bag and an open flame overnight. <laughs> I got the whole spill on that, so if anyone's interested. Uh, <laughs> number, I'm not the tattoo artist, but I can make the ink for you. Number three, uh, decaf coffee can be its own form of currency or pretty much anything else. Number four, uh, microwaves can be used in ways that are more, more than just cooking food. You can use them to uh, light cigarettes. I, I, I don't condone. Uh, any of that. Uh, our, our, it, the, funny, the funny thing is our cigarettes, our, our facility doesn't even allow for cigarettes. <laughs> so the fact that God's cigarettes and lighting them is, is creative. It's a testimony to the human creativity. Uh, number five. I learned, this is one I, I, I use quite a bit because part of my job, I'm, I, I love giving material. I, we've got a lot of books and it's like, here, get it out. It's knowledge, it's knowledge. I love giving reading material out. Uh, I can't always get directly to them if, if, if they're behind their door and they're not allowed to be out. But in most doors, there's about a quarter of an inch to half an inch of space. And, I, and I've been taught that you can fit an entire book under that space and slide an entire book in, in a half inch space to people uh, if you have the right technique. Number six. You don't need an oven to have a dorm-wide bake-off. A microwave sliced bread, packaged cereal, and chocolate will do. <laughs> Beautiful thing is, is the innovation. Um, and, and there's a story behind that is that was actually a dorm that Christ was moving big in. And just the bond of, of those gentlemen, they, had, they made their own Olympic Games, and, and one of those was a bake-off. They actually invited me to. <laughs> Number seven, the entire human body can fit through a small food port in a door. <laughs> Number eight, you can create an open flame using a gum wrapper and a power outlet. <laughs> Number nine, wine, wine can be made. Yeah, think about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, homemade wine can be made with fruit, bread, cleaning jug, ambition, and group, and group secrecy. <laughs> and number 10, if you want to talk to someone on the floor directly above or beneath you, uh, but you can't because you don't have a phone, you can actually use the toilet plumbing system. Again, just another testament of, of, of uh, things that I've learned in jail. Um, I promise there's been more than that, but those are some of the things that have stuck out. Uh, people often ask me, is my job safe? Do I enjoy it? The answer is yes and yes. So the nature of my job is uh, Multnomah County is one of about 5% of programs in the U.S. that has contact visits with the chaplain. Uh, a, a lot of places, if, if there's a chaplain, the chaplain goes door to door or he's behind glass, they allow me to go right in and sit down with, with, with men and women. It's just such a blessing. Um, do I feel safe? Yes. Yes, I do. There are, like I said, there are some wonderful people in there 
There's a couple of people that have had a rough go around, uh, and sometimes that comes out. But for the most part, it's people. It's, uh, it's us. It's us in this room. It's us in this room, and, and likely a lot of people are one decision away from ending up in there. So it's no different than this, but I would say if there is much difference at all, it's the hunger for God. And this is why some of our worship services yesterday, like I said, was just rocking, because there's a hunger for God. Life has become extremely real, and when people understand it's time for a change, they go after it. So yes, I feel extremely safe. With that being said, my chapel services, I get to go in with a group of 20, two to 20 inmates, depending on, uh, on the list that day. And people ask, is there an officer in there with you? No, doesn't need to be. We're there for one reason. We're there to worship and, and glorify God. Um, with that being said, there are two buttons in those rooms when it's time to go. There's one silver button when my service is over. I hit that little button, and the officer says, are you ready to go? I say, yep, ready, ready when you are. And three to 10 minutes, they'll be on their way down. That's how I dismiss service. Uh, now, like I said, there's a second button. There is a big red button on the wall. And what do you guys think red means? <laughs> help. <laughs> Red means help. I haven't had to use it yet, and I don't anticipate using it. But if something happens and things get out of hand, I just hit that red button. And what it is, is it's a distress alarm. And at that point, no matter what the deputies are doing, they drop whatever they're doing and they get there. It doesn't matter if uh, they're taking a short break. It doesn't matter if they're doing paperwork. It doesn't matter even if they're dealing uh, something rough on their end because they just got off a tough assignment. If that alarm goes off, it means there's an emergency. It's distress. Get there. In Matthew 14, we find Jesus responding to a red button of sorts. Even though he's recovering uh, in, in this story, I'll give you some background context. Uh, his cousin, John the Baptist, had just passed away. It was sudden, it wasn't expected, and John the Baptist was only in prison for doing a righteous thing. He was God's mouthpiece, he was God's prophet. And he actually did something that was brave and, and, and brought correction to the king for the king's moral indiscretions. He says, you're leading this nation, you need to align things better than you are right now. Through a weird series of events, um, someone asked for John Baptist to be murdered, and that's what happens, the king made a pretty brash oath, and had to honor it. He felt he had to honor it. At this point, the more integrous thing would have been due to break the oath and honor the life. Uh, but sometimes this world gets that, those things backwards. Uh, sometimes uh, the world will honor the, the letter of a contract over human life. They will honor the severity of a situation over human life. And that's what we see Jesus doing the opposite of here. Even though the life of his cousin was an honor, the life of his relative, the life of the one close to him, uh, Jesus turns around and, and, and he honors those who come searching for him. He honors those who are hitting that red button. So even though he's recovering from the sudden death of his cousin, he comes out of his place of solitude to answer those who are desperate for his help. If you don't mind turning to Matthew 14, we're gonna read verses, uh, we're gonna read verses 12 through 23. It's kind of a bigger chunk. This is the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and usually a sermon on Jesus feeding the 5,000 plus men and women would just march through that passage. And we're gonna do a bit of that, but something stuck out to me. It's situated in the middle of Jesus' retreat. Again, what do we say? What is Jesus just going through right there, here? He lost his cousin, John the Baptist, someone who I got to imagine was probably somewhat of a kindred spirit. Jesus and John the Baptist were both misunderstood by society. They were both bringing a radical message that people weren't ready to hear and some people were desperate to hear. They might have looked like fringe characters. John the Baptist wore camel hair and a belt of leather and ate locusts and honey and lived out in the wilderness. 
says Jesus had no place to lay his head. He also is living a life that wasn't conventional. John the Baptist might have been what you call, maybe a word to be used as eccentric. Maybe a little bit misunderstood by society. And maybe some of us can identify with that. Jesus, likewise, was definitely misunderstood by society for his own reasons. So again, these two have similar experiences as they're coming to minister God's word. John the Baptist as the prophet and Jesus as the word of God himself. And we find society doesn't return the favor too likely to them. Starting in verse 12, after John the Baptist's uh, life is taken, it says this, and his disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, came and they took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowd heard of it, but when the crowd heard of it, they followed him on foot. I'm sorry, let me set my alarm. <laughs> they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away so they may go into the villages and buy food so they might have food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we, we only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and, and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and to the disciples gave them to the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. I don't want to stop right there. As we're going into the next story, may, maybe the subtitle on your, on your Bible says, Jesus walks on water. I want us to catch the first couple sentences here. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. He returned to the place he originally was after he got this bad news. He hears the bad news and he retreats to this desolate place. It, may, it might not have been the exact same location, but on, on the front end of the story, he goes to this desolate place. In the middle of this section, we see he sees the people ashore and has compassion on them and serves the people. And then what does he do? He returns to this desolate place. Why do we think Jesus went to be alone after he got this bad news? The point number one I want to make is this. Jesus is never too busy for us. Jesus is never too busy for you. No matter what red buttons may go on off in this world, he always responds to those who come seeking him. We see Jesus leave for a place of, of solitude. He gives his, and then he gives his full attentions to his followers, and then he returns again to that place of solitude. What is he doing in these places? I would suggest he's being with the Father. At the, at the end, we learn he was praying. Of course, he's being with the Father. Why do we want to get away when things get hard? A lot of times, we don't want people to see us cry. That's okay. Uh, a lot of times, we just need relief and recovery. A lot of times we just need the Lord to refresh us. We need to learn to cope and heal. We need to hear from God. We need to grieve. I think this is what Jesus was doing. Yes, I said it. I, I believe uh, Jesus was, was grieving. Scripture says he's a man of many sorrows. He's a man well acquainted with, with tears. We see the night before he was crucified. He goes and he's in such anxiety that it's like he's sweating blood. 
I think he was grieving. He knew he was gonna be separate from the Father the following night. Yes, he is God. He is perfect in his divinity, but we have to understand this. He steps into this world with us. He steps into this world. And in those moments when we feel like we're alone and we're on an island and our red button is, has been hit and we're saying, God, where are you? He says, I am there with you. I know your grief. You can bring it to me. You are not alone. This is the power of the gospel. So many other religions have a God where people are trying to get to them, get to enlightenment, get to nirvana, get to what is above. We have a God who says, I'm coming down to my people. This is Jesus. I heard one minister say this as he was talking about Jesus helping the adulterous woman. This picture of Jesus stooping down to her when the crowd is accusing, when the crowd is accusing her, the minister said, that is what Jesus is, God stooping down to humanity. The psalmist says, you incline your ear to me, this picture of him bending down. He hears us. In the middle of his grieving, in the middle of this time where he's going to be alone to be with the Father, Lord, I just need some time. Lord, heal me, help, pre prepare me, recharge me, help me to process this. He sees the people and, and he comes out of his grieving to tend to their needs. Chuck Smith of, of Calvary Chapel said this. He, he, he was talking about Jesus in this situation. He goes, you try to go off alone and have just a little bit of time to wait upon, to wait upon God and to pray and to sort of get yourself collected. And you get to the other side and here's a whole multitude of people waiting there for you. Now it would have been very easy for Jesus to have been brusque and to say, Look, I came over to get some rest. Can't you leave me alone? And I know so many people who have a great ministry today who would do just that. But Jesus, when he saw the great multitude, was moved with compassion toward them. I love how he says that, toward them. That's real compassion in our life. It moves us toward people, not into isolation, but toward humanity and humanity's brokenness. And I think, and we're going to continue to see this in the sermon, God wants to use us. We all experience pain at some point. Jesus, in the, in the midst of his pain, sees sheer compassion, has sheer compassion on these people as he sees their need. It's almost like an, a sensitive heart can feel for other sensitivity. A hurting heart can feel for others in heart. Jesus does this so perfectly, and he demonstrates for us how we can move toward others even when we feel like the devil's trying to make us stop. We, you know we have an enemy, right? He throws all sorts of curveballs at us, all sorts of plots, plans, and schemes to get us to stop. But God says, no, 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 no. I'm going to keep you moving toward people. My supervisor at work says, God does not waste pain. God, think about that. How many times in your, in your life have you just wanted to lick your wounds? Have you just wanted, you, you take a hit and you just want to tend to that wound. But some other need arrives and the world keeps moving. If we are situated in God, he will move us toward people. He will not let our pain be wasted. God is a God of the individual. Verse 14 says this. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. We're gonna see two elements here, a God of the crowd and a God of the individual. He healed their sick. I don't know how long they were out there. It had to have been hours to go through this crowd and tend to every single individual. Have you ever watched um, maybe a president or a celebrity on TV, and it's almost selective how many handshakes they can do because they've got one guy with them, and what's that guy's job? Yep, keep on moving, Mr. President. <laughs> keep on moving, Mr. President. Everyone wants to get a handshake, but not everybody can. We see Jesus here tending to the individual. In the midst of his pain with this crowd in front of him, he looks through the crowd and he ciphers who needs healing and he answers them as they're hitting the red button. He doesn't move on. He doesn't usher himself on. He spends the time with the people. 
No matter what's going on, nobody gets lost in the shuffle with Jesus. He sees us all day, every day. He has time for us. None of us are too small. None of us are insignificant. When I think about the world, I go, 8 billion people? There's 8 billion people, and his mind is so big that he spends time with me individually every day. Let's go out to humanity. Let's look at the world. This world itself. Look, we're sitting here, and it feels like we're still, right? We're spinning at 1,000 miles per hour right now. We, we are moving around the sun over 66,000 miles per hour. It said if, if we were to try to get to, I think from the sun to Pluto, it would take, no, I, I looked this up. It says Pluto takes 246 to 249 years to orbit around the sun. It takes us one. That's how big the universe is. It takes Pluto almost 250 years to get around the sun once. That's a long winter. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I don't know if I could take that much rain. <laughs> uh, Jupiter. Jupiter is a meteorite magnet. It is sucking meteorites so they don't hit Earth. Why do I say this? I didn't say this to give you some sort of science lesson. I'm saying this so we can see how grand God is. He has designed this entire universe. It's so, it's so profound. It's so distinct. Every single element. 5% more oxygen, we would have fires bursting out. 5% less, we would not be able to breathe. He has designed everything so precise. Why? To sustain his people. And if you were to back all the way to outer space and you would see this little blue rock that looks insignificant, but God goes, no, that's of great value. Why? Because my people are there. He's a God who can create and sustain all of that and still stoop down to the individual still stoop down and meet us in our pain, still come and celebrate with us in our victories. This is the God that we serve. He is a God of the individual. God does not overlook a single person. Maybe some of us feel like we haven't heard from God in a while or we don't know how to talk to him anymore. I guarantee you, we are talking about a God who can't wait for your feet to hit the floor in the morning. I want to be with my child today. This is our God. This is the God who comes off of the boat to meet the crowd. This is the God who sees every red button in our life and doesn't ignore them. We see he's a God of the individual, but he's also a God of the people, the crowd, the many. He feeds the 5,000 men plus women and children, and no one is left out. He did not call people out to categorize them by their sin. Say, he, didn't, he didn't say those who are without sin get to go first through the buffet line. He doesn't say that. Jesus meets every single person and they have their fill. He didn't categorize by race. He didn't categorize by income or ability level. God's eyes are on the entire church, regardless of even pandemic or social unrest, God has his hand directly working in the church. God, you see, he, he created this world and, and the systems in it, and then he works in these world systems. And, and so often we can get discouraged and, and go, well, what's going on? Christians, believe me, we're not losing. The devil wants us to think we are. The pastor at the church that I grew up at says, you plus God is the majority. You plus God is the majority. It might look like the world is against you. It might look like people at work are against you, but they might not know you got the one inside you who brings victory. Amen. We can stand on the grace of God. Us plus God is the majority. That's the whole mission of Christ, God coming to us God with us to gather us to himself. Last year, we know that things got to a standstill. Even churches weren't allowed to meet for a while there. Uh, there, was so, there was so much unknown with the virus. And then downtown, if, if, if you 
put on top of it the social unrest. My, the building that I work in is the building that the rioters tried to burn down. And the building right next to it is the one that you saw on uh, CNN or Fox or CBS or, or whatever you watch with um, the National Guard going in there. In fact, there was so much going on. If you look, all that is boarded up now. And it looks like a, it looks, it looked like a ghost town, not so much anymore, but you would drive by that building and think there's nothing going on there. That's due to both the virus and the social unrest. And when even churches couldn't meet, we had this situation where when, when the virus hit, they suspended all of our volunteer chaplains. That was about 42 people. That was about 42 people bringing the name of Christ to the hallways, to the dorms, uh, to the building, of, uh, uh, to the MA population. And we had a situation where we went four months where we couldn't do anything. Only myself and the other staff chaplain could go make some visits here and there. Things were very abbreviated. Uh, but church was just shut down inside the jail like it was out on the outside of the jail. Four months in, my supervisor goes and looks at the captain. The captain of the downtown jail in Portland, Oregon, where, where the height of everything is happening. And he says, stands in his doorway and says, these guys need chapel. Captain sitting down, looks at him and says, you're right, they need to go to church. <laughs> Four months into the pandemic, I guarantee you churches out here were shut down. And, and don't get me wrong, God knew a pandemic was coming. God had the internet ready for us in 2020. And God still had ways for us to, to fellowship. But things we know got shut down in person. And that was no different on the inside. And you're telling me downtown Portland, downtown Portland, the epicenter of all of that here in Oregon, we open after four months. And then month by month, we're allowed to do more chapel. Right? So you know how I said God gave us the internet knowing this was coming in 2020 and 2021? I also believe that in the downtown Portland jails, God gave us a captain who would get church going again, who would get the name of God around, around the halls again, who's trying to get volunteers back in, who cares to have the ministry thrive. God knew who the captain would be this year. Not all of them would have done that. But God knew, you see what I'm saying is God can work in these systems. God can work for the crowd, for the people, with the crowd, with the people. He is also a God of compassion. His heart is moved when he sees the people. His heart was in pain, but he was soft toward his followers. He sees our condition regardless of what else, whatever else is going on. And this is what I love about this part. Jesus shows us how to value relationship over religiosity. He was in his prayer closet, if you will. And, and don't get me wrong, I think Jesus pretty much lived in his prayer closet. Even though he was out publicly, he's always in communication with his father. He says, I can do nothing that I don't hear or see my father do or say. But he was in this time of isolation. And he comes out of that and lets that be interrupted to tend to the people. Uh, an ironic statement that one of my professors made one time was, and he, it, it, was, it was a joke he was saying, but he said, often people say, I love ministry, but I can't stand people. <laughs> like, that don't make sense. The ministry is about the people. I think Jesus is being refreshed by his father because his father says, there's a crowd coming. They need you. I know you're hurting, but they need you. You look at... Um, I believe it was Ezekiel. His wife dies, and his, and his father says there's still people who need to be ministered to. So he calls them, even in his grieving, to touch those who still need to hear from the Lord. Uh, Jesus even critiques um, when he sees other substitute compassion for religion. Mark 7, verses 9 through 13 says this. 
And this is as he's speaking to the Pharisees and, and those bringing the religious law. Then he said, you skillfully, Jesus said this, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold to your own traditions. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God, honor your father and mother. And anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father and mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say their parents, sorry, I can't, I can't help you for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you let them disregard their needy parents. And so you counsel the words of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is only one example among many others. Jesus is looking at the people and he says, you're saying you're a people of the law. You're trying to hold up the Mosaic law, the, the law that Moses, that God gave to Moses for the people. One of those laws that Moses gave was honor your mother and father. But when your mother and father come along and they say, hey, I'm really strapped. I need help. I can't make rent. The lights are going to go off. I don't have money to feed the kids. Can you spare me a little bit? Can you loan me something? I'll pay you back. You say, sorry, I can't give you this money because this is my money to worship God with. <laughs> He's saying, you hypocrites, you are calling something that is devoted to worship and you're calling it away from effectiveness and usefulness for the very people that I want to care for. And it's almost as if some people uh, were, were picking and choosing, and, and, and if we look, we still do this today, of what part of Scripture do we want to hold up perfectly? But this is what I love about God's commands to us. It's all about relationship. There's no formula. We can't put how to be a Christian in a beaker and mix it up and say, take this potion. It's not steps, it's, yes, the Lord says this and the Lord says this. How do I do both? How do I honor God and honor people? Um, don't get me wrong here. We need to have those things in our life, those devotional times, those, those practices, those things we do devote to God with our finances, with our heart, with our time, with our attention, with our relationship. But are we living in a point where we can't come out of, uh, where we can't come out of the prayer closet to respond to an emergency happening in the house. I think this is what Jesus is saying. He says, when the house is burning down, go get the fire extinguisher. And I think he shows us we are allowed to do this. We're allowed to do this. We're allowed to move around with some freedom as I see need, as I see help. Actually, that time that I was spending with the guys preparing me for those moments of need and help. And I think Jesus is encouraging us in that. Walk freely as Christians, as you see hurt, go and be with the people. Be relational about these things. We can see Jesus practices exactly what he preaches. As, as he's preaching this in Mark 7, he too gets out of the boat when his time comes to reach out. He says, the people are here, it's time. My people came to see me, let me meet them. Let our time with the Father turn us outward toward others and not inward toward self. Number two is this, and these next two points will go quite a bit quicker. I want to spend more time on pick, unpacking point number one. Number two is this. What we learn from the crowd is to allow for the Lord's creativity in our lives. The people chased the Lord and trusted that he would figure out the rest. The fact that they go and they spend all day with God and there are only five fish and two loaves of bread. Tells me they didn't prioritize a travel itinerary. They didn't say, let's pack the camper or the pack mule or whatever they would have had back then. They said, ooh, Jesus is on the move. Get your sandals, let's go. And they ran. One of the commentaries I read said they would have, how would they have found him? It says they probably saw him take off in the boat, measured the trajectory, and ran around to where they thought he was going to land. What a passion for the Lord. What a passion for the Lord. It's almost as if we bring ourselves, he can fill in the blanks. They did not know how Jesus would meet their needs, but he, they knew that he would take care of them. 
They didn't seem to have a major plan or agenda. They just wanted to be with him. And this is what I love. They heard that Jesus was in the area. They trusted and followed him after they heard. They, they heard and they responded. And they trusted him to provide all they would need. And then they stayed in his presence. They stayed tuned. We might, have, we might use that, that, you might hear that term on TV when you're watching a show and you can feel it's going to uh, a commercial right before they do the big reveal. And you want to find out who won the singing contest. And they say, stay tuned after we hear from our sponsors. They stay tuned. For me, I, I know I've been thinking lately, it might be annoying my wife, but when a commercial comes on, I'm clicking. I'm changing. I find myself, I have turned into my father. I'm out of there and I'm finding something else that's playing. They didn't do this. They had patience. They stayed tuned. They weren't flipping channels. <laughs> they weren't looking for the next uh, big thing. They waited patiently for Christ to the point where hunger started creeping out. The crowd in this story searched for Christ, and when they found him, he satisfied both their physical and their spiritual hunger. Now, I'm not saying don't prepare anything. God gives us a mind for wisdom, so we can use wisdom. But I'm saying being open to the Lord achieving things in your life that you might not imagine be open to the Lord achieving things that might go a different way than you would have expected. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. What are the areas in our lives right now that we can remember to keep our mind open to how God might be working? Maybe you heard a recent piece of advice from an unlikely source. And you're going, hmm, that guy doesn't usually make much sense. Make much sense. I listen to what they're saying. And you're trying to figure out, do I keep that advice or do I throw it away merely because his reputation? Maybe you recently, um, or maybe God wants to bless you in some sort of way, but you're having trouble accepting generosity from another person. Maybe God is offering emotional healing in ways that seem unorthodox or peculiar even spiritual healing in a sense. We, we see there are a lot of stories right now of a lot of Muslims coming to faith in Christ through dreams. God is appearing in ways that seem unorthodox to people. Uh, just really quick anecdotal story. Uh, a few years ago, I was coaching a, a, a baseball team in, in Portland, and I was going from seminary to the baseball field. And the one thing I didn't want to do was be late for the first pitch. And I'm like, okay, I've got about 12 minutes I can get there. You know, you got it timed down perfectly. I had to fly down Gleason Street, but Gleason was being repaired at the time. So there was this major dip down. And so traffic was going slower over it. And I'm, I'm looking, I'm like, Lord, this is how we are sometimes, y'all know it. Lord, if you help me make this light... <laughs> Lord, please help me make this light. If I make this light, it's smooth sailing. I can go. So well, you know, the light goes, boom, boom. I'm in my little Ford Focus, little stick shift. Mm, mm, mm. Yellow, boom, red. Guess who's the first person at the line? Me sitting here. And I literally thought, God, you could have taken care of that. Why didn't you do that for me? <laughs> Amazing how I want God to take care of a stoplight for me. I'm going, well, that's it. I'm going to definitely be late now. I do. I get there late. But when I get there, I find that my coach is now finally doing the mound or the plate meeting with the other coach and the umpire before the game starts. You see, I wanted it to happen on the front end. I'm telling God, Lord, make this work out for me on the front end of my journey. And God is going, be patient. It's working a different way. And I'm not saying life is all about traffic and that's the most important things in the world. But I do think God was involved in that because he taught me something about himself in that. He taught me to be patient in him. And I had a head coach who was good at stalling. <laughs> Number three is this. The Lord wants to use what we already have in his kingdom. 
The Lord wants us to use what we already have in his kingdom work. We learned this from the disciples in the story, from Jesus' closest followers. Jesus already knew he was gonna do a miracle, right? He already knew he was gonna feed the multitude of people with some fish and some, and, and some loaves of bread. But he still let them come in question. If Jesus knew he was gonna do this, and, and believe me, he's scanning around, he's not seeing food carts or caterers, he knows there's nothing there. He knows it's in a desolate place. That is a place without food. This is a place in the wilderness. This is a place where he saw his followers put on their sandals and run to meet him there and, and measure his trajectory. They had nothing with them. He knew what he was going to do. So why didn't Jesus just snap his fingers, clap his hands, and, and say, boom, all these stones are now multitudes of fish and loaves? He could have done that, right? I think he's thinking deeper than that. I, I think the answer is in verses 17 and 18. They, the disciples, said to Jesus, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them here. Let's emphasize that word, bring. He's saying, I know you don't have a lot, but what you do possess, bring that to me. And let me use what you already have to help the people. Do you hear where I'm going with this? Jesus did not do the miracle alone. He could have. He did plenty of miracles alone. But he didn't do this one alone because he wants to use what the disciples have. He wanted them to participate with him in helping him feed the people. Likewise, Jesus wants to use us in building his kingdom. Yes, he can do it alone, but he is relational in his being. So he invites us to partner with him in healing the broken and healing a hurting world. Why does he spend so much time healing the individual? Because he sees what's in us. He sees what he put in us. And he wants to draw that out and use it to heal his people. He wants to use his people to heal his people. By not sending the crowd or his disciples away to get more food, but using the little they already had, Jesus is saying, you do not have to have plenty to be effective in my kingdom. You just have to bring me the resources that you already have, and I will multiply them. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, God promises that his grace is enough. What an honor and how highly God thinks of us. Brothers and sisters, please do not be down on yourselves. Please do not wake up down on yourselves because you have a God who's looking at you and saying, I know the potential in my people. If they will just bring it to me, I can use it. Let's not store it in. Let's let our time with the Lord turn us out toward people and not inward toward self. Again, the, the pastor at the church that I grew up in says, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the helper, not the doer. He's not saying, I'm going to come and do everything for you, but I'm going to help you. I'm going to empower you to good works. We have a part in God's kingdom work. As Jesus puts skin on the bones of compassion, he teaches his disciples and us to do the same. When resources seem short emotionally, financially, physically. He uses what we have and gives us endurance to do the work. What do I mean by skin on the bones? I think so often when we think about love, it's emotional sentiment. And Jesus says, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. What was he doing right before he said that? He was on his hands and knees scrubbing their feet. Jesus' loves includes service. It's not, I'm a Christian, so I love everybody. And, and he, I had to ask myself as I was checking myself, yeah, I understand I got to love everybody, but do I got to like everybody? <laughs> Jesus is going, I love and I like you. I move toward compassion for my people, regardless of sin, regardless of shortfallings. It doesn't say he goes through the car crowd and picks out which ones aren't qualified 
Rather, he says, you're all qualified because I have all called you. That's something that people say quite a bit. And maybe we can learn from the disciples. God, how's it go? God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. What that means is I don't have to have a long list and, and resume of credentials for him to work through me. I just have to have a willing heart and say, Lord, I offer this to you. If I can bring that, he can use it. He teaches us to look to him for answers and to solutions that seem impossible. He looks to us to take part in his kingdom mission. Working with, can you believe God is asking us to work with him in healing his world? Well, if I don't think I have anything I can offer, my advice would be to this. Start with what you know everyone has and then work to, as you brainstorm, what you have specifically to yourself. Everyone has time. Everyone, if you're physically capable, can make a phone call. Anyone can write a letter. Anyone can give a listening ear. Even if we don't know the answers to give people, we can sit there and be and hear them. We can all give encouragement. We can all go to a basketball game and, and, and cheer. We can all be with someone in that sense. And then maybe more specifically, maybe you're good at crafts. Uh, that's one of my favorite things to receive from the people I serve is I've seen some great artwork. I've seen some origami when they, they give me a craft that they've done. Uh, that, that, that's beautiful to me. Maybe there's a recipe that you specialize in. My father-in-law makes good cinnamon rolls. <clears throat> Holiday season's coming up. <laughs> hint, hint, hint. Uh, maybe God has given you leadership skills. Or maybe you have a guest room or a couch that someone can use while, while times are rough. Maybe it's a conversation. Uh, often we value transaction instead of interaction. Often we'd rather give someone something instead of spend time and hear their story. Maybe it's conversation. What are our individual gifts? What is something that we all can give and then what is so and so we can give as individuals that we can specialize in? I wanna conclude with this. Uh, when someone is hitting the red button in life, let's ask ourselves, what are the resources we can bring that the Lord can use through us? Maybe we're hitting that red button and going, God, but I still want to stay open to other people's red buttons. In Matthew 14, we learn that Jesus uh, always has time for his people, no matter the circumstances. In his response of compassion, we learn how to seek the welfare of others, even when it feels like things in our lives aren't in good shape. From the crowd, we learn to be open to the Lord's creativity, to seek his presence, and to seek him as the provider. Our endurance in him must match our excitement for him. They had a lot of zeal getting to Christ, but they also had endurance that kept them there with Christ. My encouragement to us as Christ's disciples is that he is looking to what we already have to use in his kingdom work. And he wants to grow that and develop new things. He wants, to part, he wants us to partner with him and participate in him healing the world. If we bring what we have, he can use it. If we have been told that, uh, as we were being told that God doesn't waste pain, we can think about even in our hardest times how he can use us in our condition to turn us toward others and look at them with compassion. Father, I pray for um, the believers in the room and, and those who might not be believers. I pray that every day as we seek your face, we are warmed and, and we notice the significance of your compassion in our lives and let that compassion change us from the inside out. Let it grab hold of our hearts, Father. Allow us to turn outward toward others instead of inward to ourselves. We just thank you. We glorify you for your goodness and for God who has the best at heart for us 24-7. In Jesus' name, amen.